Tonight on Y News. Boracay Island hit by flash floods amid ongoing rehabilitation efforts. A new low pressure area spotted west of the country, seen to further enhance the southwest monsoon and tropical dip storm Falcon. Magasa's weather bulletin now emphasizes wind speed. President Rodrigo Duterte, still the most trusted government official based on the latest Pulse Asia survey. And Manila City Mayor Isco Moreno eyes to rehabilitate next the Vita Slaughterhouse in Tondo, saying the area is in a state of despair. Good evening. Local government units in Metro Manila and nearby provinces suspended classes earlier than expected, and the public is happy with it. This, as Tropical Storm Falcon continues to affect parts of the country. Monoxon will tell us why. As early as midnight of July 16, classes in schools were suspended by different local government units in Metro Manila. This is unlike before, when children were already in schools before class suspensions were declared. This, because it is indicated on the Department of Education's guidelines on class suspension, that classes must be declared suspended earlier when there is a typhoon or natural disaster that may affect or is affecting an area. Classes are suspended in all levels in both public and private schools in Metro Manila, Cagayan Province, Cavite, Rizal, Abra, Apayao, Manawag, Pangasinan, and Mangaldan, Pangasinan. Classes in preschool and senior high school are suspended in Angeles City, Pampanga, Baknotan, La Union, Kalasyaw, Pangasinan, Dagupan City, Infanta, Pangasinan, Lingayen, Pangasinan, and Iloilo City. Preschool and elementary levels in San Jose, Nueva Ecija, and Bautista, Pangasinan. And only preschool students in Tabuk City in Kalinga, Apayao. In Metro Manila, mayors announced the suspension of classes an hour before midnight. Mayor Isco Moreno of Manila City went around his vicinity to check the situation before announcing the suspension of classes. Mayor Vico Soto of Pasig City immediately went to the command center to monitor if there are places affected by Typhoon Falcon. Vice Mayor Gian Soto declared the suspension of class in Quezon City, while Mayor Joy Belmonte is out of the country. The public is happy with the early announcement of the class suspensions. Netizens express their gratitude on social media because of the quick decisions made by their local governments. Tropical Storm Falcon, with international name Danas, is expected to continue to bring heavy rain over parts of Luzon and Visayas. Monoxon, UNTV News and Rescue. Some residents of Boracay Island are experiencing flood flooded streets. This despite modern technology used to mitigate flood on the island. Vincent Arboleda tells us why. Heavy rains since Tuesday has brought floods in some parts of Boracay Island. Some areas are even experiencing knee-deep flood such as Barangay Balabag. There are flooded streets even in Barangay Manok Manok. These are despite the technology being used on the island such as high-density polyethylene plastic or HDPE plastic that serves as storm drain on the island. Since nang hindi pa tapos yung rehabilitation, may mga area po na talagang uh, baba. And so, we ask na plan na pag merong mga ulan, meron po mag-standby na mga na water pump. According to the Malay Municipal Disaster Risk Reduction Management Council or MDRRMC, large water pumps from the Boracay Island Water Company or BIWC are used in areas with deep flood water. While smaller water pumps from the local government of Malay Aklan and other water pumps from the Department of Public Works and Highways are used in areas with shallow flood water. Despite efforts in lowering the level of flood water, some areas remain flooded such as Demo area. Ulan po kasi kahapon is uh, nasa red siya, ibig sabihin heavy rain. So, 
medyo malakas talaga yung ulan nun. At saka yung hindi pa talaga tapos yung rehabilitation natin sa Boracay. The MDRRM officer adds that they are on standby through their Facebook page and hotline numbers in case of emergency on the island. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue, Boracay. A new low-pressure area west of the Philippines will further enhance the southwest monsoon and tropical storm Falcon. The LPA was last spotted 180 kilometers west of Sinait, Ilocos Sur. The Philippine Atmospheric Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration said Falcon was last observed 265 kilometers east of Calayan, Cagayan, with maximum sustained winds of 65 kilometers per hour near the center and gusts of up to 80 kph. It moved 20 km per hour west-northwest. Signal number two remained hoisted over Batanes. Apayao, Cagayan, Ilocos Norte, and Babuyan group of islands, meanwhile, are under signal number one. Moderate to heavy rains are being experienced over Ilocos region, Cordillera Administrative Region, Cagayan Valley, Central Luzon, Cavite, Batangas, Occidental Mindoro, Northern Palawan, including Kalamian and Cuyo Islands, Aklan, Antique, Capiz, Iloilo, and Guimaras. Meanwhile, light to moderate with at times heavy rains will continue over Metro Manila, B Bicol region, and the rest of Visayas and the rest of Mimaropa. The country's weather agency revises the warning it issues to the public to emphasize the wind strength a tropical cyclone brings. Ray Pelayo will tell us why in this exclusive report. We hear a tropical cyclone warning signal in an occurrence of a tropical cyclone. But what does it mean? Tropical cyclone warning signal is part of the bulletin issued by the Philippine Atmospheric, Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration or PAGASA during the existence of a tropical cyclone that can affect the country. But the weather agency has modified the warning they issue to emphasize the wind strength of a weather disturbance, thus changing the name to Tropical Cyclone Wind Signal. So, ibig sabihin yung intensity ng bagyo, hindi porke maulan ay malakas na yung bagyo. So, talagang dun tayo tumitingin sa lakas ng hangin na dala niya. Kaya, pinalitan ho natin ito or nirevise po natin ito ng wind signal. Signal number one, the expected speed of wind in at least 36 hours is 30 to 60 kilometers per hour. This means the cyclone can damage structures made with light materials and break tree branches. Signal number two means the expected speed of wind in at least 24 hours is between 61 to 120 kilometers per hour. This wind signal means the cyclone can topple utility posts, can cause leaning of banana trees, and can rip off house roofs. Signal number 3 means the wind speed that may be expected in at least 18 hours is between 121 to 170 kilometers per hour. Signal number 4 means the wind speed that may be expected in at least 12 hours is between 171 to 220 kilometers per hour. While signal number 5 means the wind is faster than 220 kilometers per hour in at least 12 hours. With cyclone signals 4 and 5, a storm surge of up to 2 to 3 meters high may threaten the coastal communities. Pagasas Bulletins now has a separate column for the amount of rainfall that may affect certain areas to inform residents and help in preparation for a possible flood. The Weather Service also issues heavy rainfall warning for other weather systems that may bring heavy rains such as Southwest Monsoon or Habagat, Northeast Monsoon or Amihan, low pressure area and thunderstorms. May mga bagyo na kakaunti yung dalang ulan, meron din naman na uh, talagang mala, madaming ulan na dala. Meron ding LPA na mas marami pang ulan na dala kaysa sa tropical depression. Ray Pilayo, UNTV, News and Rescue, Quezon City. Local rice farmers are complaining on the very low price of their produce. Meanwhile, the government will implement suggested retail price for rice. Ray Pilayo is back to, to explain why. Local farmers may incur an annual loss of 140 billion pesos if the low price of palay will continue. 
Agriculture Secretary Manny Pinyola said the farm gate price of Palainao is just 12 to 14 pesos per kilogram from 20 pesos per kilogram before the rice tarification law or RTL was implemented in March. The official pointed out the liberalization of importation that makes traders earn a huge income. Landed costs of prices are cheaper like those from Myanmar at only 18 pesos per kilogram. The RTL also stripped off the power of the National Food Authority to regulate the rice industry in the country. Masyadong ganado mag-import yung mga traders right now. Kasi feeling nila wala nang magkocontrol sa presyo ng bentahan nila ng bigas sa palengke. So manapakalaki ng margin of profit nila. Based on the Agriculture Department's monitoring, rice prices ranges from 32 to 70 pesos per kilogram with only a 1 to 2 peso decrease per kilogram. This is about a quarter of the expected reduction in the price of commercial rice in connection with the implementation of RTL which is supposed to be 7 pesos. The DA will impose suggested retail price on commercial rice starting next week. Rice may be priced at around 35 to 80 pesos per kilogram. We would like to, ano eh, to address the greed of uh, some importers no? Do sa markup nila napakalaki by uh, setting a cap on uh, the selling price of imported rice. The official said the implementation of SRP is based on the Price Act wherein violators may be fined. National Food Authority already implemented SRP on rice before but it was invalidated due to the implementation of the rice tarification law. Pinyol said that the law does not specify a limitation on rice that the country may import but the president may increase the tariff if there is an oversupply. Ray Pilayo, UNTV, News and Rescue, Quezon City. Manila Mayor Isko Moreno confirms Vita Slaughterhouse in Tondo, Manila will undergo rehabilitation. The local chief executive denies he is anti-vendor following a series of clearing operations in the city. April Senadoza tells us why. After his various inspections in Manila City, Mayor Isko Moreno today visited Vita Slaughterhouse located in Tondo. According to the local chief executive, the filthy meat facility needs to be rehabilitated. We will try to come up with the new slaughterhouse. Uh, In-city vertical housing program will uh, also be constructed here. And it's going to be a community of uh, development. The mayor also showed the design of the proposed new Vita slaughterhouse. The Manila City government plans to build poultry dressing area, house compound for the residents, admin city compound, as well as cattle and hog pens within the compound. He vows to Tondo residents that he will not turn the facility into a casino. Meanwhile, Mayor Isco denied he is anti-vendor. This after a series of clearing operations in the city. Let's prove them wrong. Hindi ako anti-vendor. Alam mo yung ako? Ito na, itag nyo na ako. Anti-organizer ako. Kasi walang pinagkaiba sa mga kriminal. In two weeks, his administration was able to remove illegal vendors and clear obstructions in Divisoria and Carredo Street in Quiapo. He also ordered the flushing operations at the Bonifacio Shrine in Loton after his inspection in the area, which used to be surrounded by manure. The latest was when the Manila City LGU conducted cleaning operations at the Lagusnilad underpass near the City Hall. April Senedoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. Foreign Affairs Secretary Teddy Loxin Jr. reveals the Philippines will stay with the United Nations Human Rights Council. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. Foreign Affairs Secretary Teddy Loxin insists the Philippines has to teach Europeans moral manners so the country must stay in the United Nations Human Rights Council or UNHCR. The official also said that the UNHRC vote is a small and harmless matter in which 17 countries supported the Iceland resolution, calling on the UNHRC to investigate the anti-drug war of the Duterte administration. The palace has said the Philippines staying in the UNHRC depends on President Rodrigo Duterte's final decision. 
Secretary Loxin also emphasizes the Philippines will not cut its ties with Iceland. But this contradicts an earlier statement of Malacanang. Well, he mentioned last night that he's seriously considering cutting diplomatic ties with Iceland. <clears throat> there are only about 2,000 Filipinos there. And as far as we know, there are no trade relations between these two countries, except maybe on fish. Meanwhile, the Duterte administration does not mind the Iceland resolution because it is not adopted by the simple majority of the UNHRC member countries. The palace has also been saying that the resolution is based on wrong information and unverified facts. Based on the resolution, the Human Rights Council expresses concern at the allegations of human rights violations in the Philippines, particularly those involving killings, enforced disappearances, arbitrary arrest and detention, the intimidation and persecution, or violence against members of civil society, human rights defenders, indigenous peoples, journalists, lawyers, and members of the political opposition and restrictions on the freedoms of opinions and expression, peaceful assembly and association. It also emphasizes the right to life must be respected and protected by all government agencies in their efforts to address drug-related crimes and that the allegations of drug trafficking offenses should be judged in a court of law. The UNHRC also urges the Philippine government to take all necessary measures to prevent extrajudicial killings and enforce disappearances, to carry out impartial investigations and to hold perpetrators accountable in accordance with the rule of law. It also calls upon the Philippine government to cooperate with the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and the mechanisms of the Human Rights Council, including facilitating country visits and preventing and refraining from all acts of intimidation and retaliation. The UNHRC also requested the High Commissioner to prepare a comprehensive written report on the situation of human rights in the Philippines and to present it to the Human Rights Council at its 44th session to be followed by an enhanced interruptive dialogue. However, the palace has responded to the issue. Kung gusto ng isang bansa at kung sila ay seryoso <clears throat> sa kanilang pag-alala sa paglabag ng karapatang batas dito sa ating bayan, ang gagawin lamang nila ay magbigay ng komunikasyon o sulat sa ating formal. At tanungin tayo, kaugnay sa mga kalakaran, kaugnay dito sa digmaan laban sa droga na nilunsad ng Pangulong Duterte simula sa kanyang pagupo bilang presidente, you know, they get to believe what this government tells them. Because this government doesn't lie. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang. Leaders of various groups who will rally on the day of President Rodrigo Duterte's State of the Nation address vow to stage a peaceful protest. Meanwhile, National Capital Region Police Office say they are ready even when President Duterte decides to talk with the protesters outside the Batasan complex. Harleen Delgado explains why. Just days before President Rodrigo Duterte delivers his fourth State of the Nation address or SONA, leaders of various groups have vowed for a peaceful protest. National Capital Region Police Office or NCRPO Regional Director Police Major General Guillermo Eliazar says the groups are one with the police to ensure a safe SONA after a successful dialogue this morning. Ituloy po natin ito dahil ang gusto nating mangyari nga magkaroon ng tahimik at maayos na sona na lahat naman po ng gusto nating mangyari base sa ating karapatan ay ating magagawa. The groups will rally as one under its umbrella group United People Sona 2019 which include Laban ng Masa, Kilusang Mayo Uno, Bagong Aliansang Makabayan, Pasang Masda, and Movement Against Tyranny. The Philippine National Police or PNP estimates 15,000 protesters will gather on the day of the SONA. Kaya po kami nandito para tiyakin na magiging maayos at uh, ilang taon na rin po kami nag-uusap ni General Eliasar. Uh, meron na tayong tried and tested. We would like to assure everybody as we have just assured the Philippine National Police that our rally 
will definitely be a very, very peaceful and organized rally. The demonstrators will assemble in different parts of Quezon City, including Agham Road in UP Diliman and Tandang Sora Avenue. They will march towards Commonwealth Avenue where their main program will be held. All lanes eastbound will be closed to accommodate the demonstrators. Meanwhile, al assures the police are ready, even if President Duterte decides to go out the Batasan complex to talk with the protesters again, just like what he did in 2017. It's more challenging for us if we're still there. If we're going to ask, it's better that they don't go there, right? But that's just for us, that's just for us, security concern. But if they're going to do it, we're going to be there. However, if violence erupts from the side of the protesters, Eliezer says that will be considered a violation. That is violation already of our agreement, right? So we, we, will, we are compelled to disperse them. The NCRPO chief adds he will coordinate with the Presidential Security Group or PSG on the implementation of temporary signal jamming within the vicinity of the Batasan complex as the president delivers his speech. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority or MMDA meanwhile appeals to the rallyists to maintain the cleanliness of the protest areas. Sana po maging responsable po tayo at uh, tagulan po ngayon ano, ang mga apekto ano niyan, mga kababayan din natin pag iniwan niyo yung kalat yan at uh, yan po yung nagbara sa ating mga drainage. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The Philippine Philharmonic Orchestra have been chosen to perform on the day President Rodrigo Duterte delivers his fourth State of the Nation address. Grace Kassin will tell us why. The Philippine Philharmonic Orchestra will serenade the guests at the fourth State of the Nation address of President Rodrigo Duterte on Monday. According to Cultural Center of the Philippines President Arsenio Lizazo, among the pieces the world-renowned orchestra will be performing are the national anthem Lupang Hinirang, Pagbabago composed by Freddy Aguilar, Mabuhay March, other nationalistic and Filipino songs, and President Rodrigo Duterte's favorite song, Ikaw. Uh, Nagre-rehearse kami sa Cultural Center, pagkatapos dito, doon sa On The Day itself. For the Philippine Philharmonic Orchestra, it's an honor to perform during the President's Sona. Ito po ang kaunanahan sa Sona. First time kami dito. At ito ay magandang pagkakataon sa Philharmonic Cultural Center of the Philippines. Dahil sa ika nga, maganda itong uh, chance nito for us to be able to play for the senators, for the congressmen, for the guests, and for the president. The officials of the group conducted an ocular at the House of Representatives today on where they will be performing for three to five hours. 65 of their 80 members will be present due to limited space. Musical theater actor, classical singer Armand Ferrer has been chosen to sing the national anthem. Grace Cassin, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. President Rodrigo Duterte is still the most trusted government official in the country. Based on the latest survey of the Pulse Asia Research Incorporated released on Wednesday, Mirasol Bugadil tells us why. Pulse Asia reported that President Rodrigo Duterte got an 85% approval and trust rating in the survey conducted from June 24 to 30. The figure was two points below the 87% that Duterte received in March. Only 3% of the 1,200 survey respondents said they disapprove of Duterte's performance as chief executive. 4% claimed to have small or no trust in him, while 11% were undecided. Earlier this month, Duterte also got a new personal record high satisfaction rating of 80% despite the ramming incident near Recto Bank in June, according to the survey of social weather stations. Vice President Maria Leonor Leni Robredo, meanwhile, obtained a 55% approval rating and 52% trust rating. 26% claimed they have small or no trust in her, while 24% disapproved of her performance as Vice President. Senate President Vicente Soto III also enjoyed high ratings in the latest survey and 73% trust rating. Pulse Asia noted that approval is the predominant opinion as regards the work of President Duterte and Senate President Soto across geographic areas. 
Vice President Robredo enjoys majority approval in most geographic areas and socio-economic groupings, with only Metro Manilans and those in Class ABC withholding majority scores from her. On the other hand, former House Speaker Gloria Macapagal Arroyo got 26% approval rating and 22% trust rating, while Supreme Court Chief Justice Lucas Bersamin obtained 41% approval rating and 35% trust rating. Among the key issues that dominated headlines during the survey period were the reported ramming of a Filipino fishing vessel in Recto Bank, the explosion in Indanan Sulu, the public school teacher's plea for pay hike, fraud allegations in the May 2019 polls, the call made by 11 United Nations experts for the conduct of a probe on the human rights situation in the Philippines, Deportation from Hong Kong of former DFA Secretary Albert Del Rosario and PhilHealth Ghost Tayalysis claims. Pulse Asia said it has 95% confidence level in the survey results with an error margin of positive negative 2.8%. Mirasol Abugadil, UNTV News and Rescue. A proposed measure seeking to prevent the proliferation of fake news in the internet has been pushed in the upcoming 18th Congress. Who will be punished and what are the penalties under this proposed law? Find out as Nel Maribujo reports. Senate President Vicente Soto III has filed a pet bill that will prevent the proliferation of fake news on social media. This will be called the Anti-False Content Act, also known as the Anti-Fake News Law. According to the Senate President, this law will protect the reputation of an individual from fake news in the internet. Mas makasira, ano, na hindi lang ng reputasyon, kundi ng mga tao, ng mga institusyon. Eh, alam naman natin kung ano ng fake news at hindi, bakit natin ito tolerate? Diba? Then dapat give, give government the chance to remove it or ask the proper authorities to remove it. But who will be punished and what are the penalties under this proposal? First, those who create or publish contents on personal online account or website knowing information that is false or would tend to mislead the public. Those who use fictitious online account or website to do the said acts. Offering or providing one service to create or publish a content that would be used to deceive the public, personalities who finance the said activity, and those who will not comply with any counteractive measures like the order of removal of the fake news. The senator clarifies that the case for legitimate media organization is different and seems not to be included in the said proposal. Some media entities are just sometimes victims of wrong information given by a source. What we're trying to achieve is that those who would like to, to uh, come up with some kind of news of their own through the social media must follow the ethics of journalists like you. You are responsible, you're accountable for what you place. Those who will violate this law may face imprisonment from 6 to 20 years or fine from 300,000 to 2 million pesos depending on what provisions of the law were violated. An individual may also face liability under the Cybercrime Prevention Act of 2012. A party or an individual may file their complaints on fake news before the Department of Justice Office of Cybercrime. The Cybercrime Division of the Philippine National Police and National Bureau of Investigation will be the law enforcement authorities. But according to constitutional law expert Attorney George Irwin Garcia, the proposal may face constitutionality issues. When you say freedom of expression, the freedom to think and to act na nawa na magre-restrain tayo. Ngayon, kung yung iyong mga nalalagay sa social media ay pwede pa lang tatanggalin ng pamahalaan o piliin ng pamahalaan kung alin yung pwede nang mabasa ng tao, to a certain extent, may tinatawag ka tayo sa constitutional law na prior restraint. Eh, yung prior restraint, pinagbabawal yun because that is a violation of the constitutional guarantee of the freedom of expression. So, ang magiging katanungan kasi dyan is paano, ano ang kriteria ng batbatasas na ito para bigyan ng kapangyarihan ng gobyerno na salain kung ano yung pwedeng mabasa lang ng publiko. Due to some challenges that may hurdle the passage of the bill, thorough debates among lawmakers on the passage of the anti-fake news bill 
is still needed. Nel Maribuhok, UNTV News and Rescue, Pasay City. A Thai teacher has a unique way of making sure his students pay attention in class by donning outrageous outfits and makeup. Kat Dumaraos tells us why. Strutting down the school corridor in a gray wig that resembles Lisa from popular K-pop band Blackpink and a set of fake eyelashes made from a rooster chicken feather duster, Tirapong Misat enters his classroom at the Pasatran Prachakit School in Ratchaburi Province to teach English. Although Tirapong 29 is not in fancy dress every day, he said being able to wear makeup to teach was a way of showing his creativity and keeping the students' attention in class. My name is Tirapong Misat. You can call me Tisha Bolly. I'm now 29 years old. I'm working as an English teacher in Prasa Rappashaki School. It all started by chance on a school day in June when Bali took part in a local parade, ran out of time, and had to rush to a class in heavy makeup and costume, and the result surprised him. They looked surprised at the very first time, and some students were scared, but surely it develops their attention in class. So they are more curious and eager to learn what is going to happen in the class. Thailand stands at 64th of 88 countries with English proficiency, the third lowest in the Southeast Asian region, and grouped in the low category in the global ranking according to the 2018 EF English Proficiency Index. Tirapong said his getup helps him become more confident and he hopes to encourage the students will be brave like him as most Thais are scared of using and speaking English due to a fear of making mistakes. <coughs> students in his class said they feel the difference between the normal classes and teacher Bally's classes as they are fun and exciting. Kat Tumaraos, TV News and Rescue, Bangkok, Thailand. Welcome back to Y News and for the news abroad, here's Stephanie C reporting live from Hong Kong. Good evening, Stephanie. Good evening, Alex. The U.S. House of Representatives voted on Tuesday to condemn President Donald Trump for racist comments against four minority Democratic Congresswomen, a symbolic vote aimed at shaming Trump and his fellow Republicans who stood by him. The 240 to 187 vote, which split mainly along party lines, was the culmination of three days of outrage sparked by a Trump tweet worm that diverted attention from other business in Washington but had little impact on the president's overall approval rating. According to a new Reuters or Ipsos poll, Trump is seeking re-election next year. Trump had told the group of Congresswomen on Sunday to go back and help fix the totally broken and crime-infested places from which they came. All four lawmakers, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez of New York, Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, Ayanna Presley of Massachusetts, and Rashida Tlaib of Michigan are U.S. citizens. Three were born in the United States. The United Nations denounced the new Trump administration's asylum interim regulation, saying the severe rule puts at risk the most vulnerable. Be Beverly Saison will tell us why. The Trump administration on Monday unveiled a new rule to bar almost all immigrants from applying for asylum at the southern border, requiring them to first pursue safe haven in a third country through which they had traveled on the way to the United States. Designated an interim final rule, the measure goes into effect on Tuesday, potentially shifting the burden onto the poorly equipped countries like Mexico and Guatemala to process asylum claims. The UN Refugee Agency warned that some of the country's immigrants travel en route for the United States may not have all the necessary means in place to process asylum claims following the requirements and guidelines of the 1951 Convention. The point about this measure is that we believe that it really puts vulnerable people at risk, vulnerable families. 
and it's also undermining efforts across the region uh, to devise uh, a response that is coherent and collective um, to, to deal with, with the, the movement of people uh, from especially the north of Central America towards the US. So what we said last night, and I'm going to repeat here, we believe that this measure is severe and it's not the best way forward. The new rule has come under criticism by the American Civil Liberties Union, which described it as patently unlawful and vowed to file a lawsuit against it, while a host of experts also questioned its legality. The new rule was announced after U.S. authorities launched small-scale operations this past weekend to arrest undocumented immigrants who had recently arrived in the country. The operations come as President Donald Trump's administration continues to face criticism for housing immigrants in overcrowded and sanitary conditions, as well as concerns about migrant children being separated from adults by U.S. authorities. Beverly Sison, UNTV News and Rescue, USA. It started as a bit of a joke, but now the U.S. Air Force has told people not to go near Area 51 in Lincoln County, Nevada, USA. Kathy Maraos will tell us why. More than a million people have RSVP'd to an event on Facebook threatening to storm the top secret base in Nevada, which some believe is home to aliens. It is scheduled for 3 a.m. on September 20th in Amargoza Valley, Nevada. Thousands have commented on the page, which reads, We can move faster than their bullets. Let's see them aliens. Facebook user Jackson Barnes wrote on the event page, quote, Hello, U.S. government. This is a joke, and I do not actually intend to go ahead with this plan. I just thought it would be funny and get me some thumbsy uppies on the internet. I'm not responsible if people decide to actually storm Area 51. But the Air Force isn't seeing the funny side. Laura McAndrews, an Air Force spokeswoman, said is ready to protect America and its assets. But as it turns out, some people may be taking the event seriously. The Little Ole Inn in Rachel, Nevada, which is close to Area 51, has gotten an unusually high number of reservations for a certain date. It really does seem like, you know, this joke is... It's created a monster. It's insane. Our phone literally has not stopped ringing. The existence of Area 51 was formally acknowledged by the federal government in 2013 when the CIA released a classified report on spy planes that were tested there beginning in the 1950s. But UFO enthusiasts and conspiracy theorists have long suspected that the base was devoted to the study or even the captivity of extraterrestrial life forms. West said Area 51 is well guarded with signs warning trespassers that they could face consequences, including prison time or deadly force if they get too close. She said she expected people to try to breach the boundaries of Area 51 in September, though she wished they would not. Kat Dumaraos, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Stephanie C. reporting live from Hong Kong. Back to the news in the country. The government has signed the much-awaited implementing rules and regulations of ease of doing business act today. The law aims to fast-track government transactions. April Senendoza will tell us why. After over a year since President Rodrigo Duterte signed the ease of doing business law, Heads of the Anti-Red Tape Authority, Department of Trade and Industry, and the Civil Service Commission this afternoon led the signing of the much-awaited Implementing Rules and Regulations of Republic Act 11032, or the Ease of Doing Business, and the Efficient Government Service Delivery Act of 2018. The signing was delayed for over a year because it was only on July 3 when President Rodrigo Duterte appointed Attorney Jeremiah Bellica as the Director General of the Anti-Red Tape Authority, or ARTA. Under the law, the President must first appoint an ARTA Director General to promulgate the IRR. It was on May 28, 2018 when the President signed the act and it took effect on June 15, 2018. As stated in the law, simple transactions take 3 days, 7 days for complex transactions, while 20 days for highly technical transactions. If the application requires some uh, technical skill 
or requires some study or has implication to public health, safety, moral, etc. Then the law provides for a long, much longer period of 20 working days to process. Only three signatories are needed for applications of clearances, permits, certification, and authorization. If a government agency fails to act on the prescribed processing time, the application is considered approved. Meanwhile, Bellica mentioned the investigation flow process for those who were willing to file a complaint. If we would determine that there is really cause for us to evaluate further or to go on with the case, after evaluation, we will now ask you to file a formal charge. We would be inviting you to now formalize your complaint by putting it in, into writing, subscribe and sworn to, nakanotaryo po, and then doon po natin pasasagutin ang tao o ang ahensya po na inyo pong niririklamo. Law violators, on the other hand, will face suspension for the first offense, while there is already administrative and criminal liability for the second offense. The IRR is set to be published on Thursday, July 18. Meanwhile, according to the sponsor of the act, Senator Juan Miguel Zubiri, they ensure the law has no loopholes. We expanded it to, to make sure that walang loopholes because really we have an anti-red tape act. April Senedoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Pasay City. The Department of Transportation targets the partial operability of MRT Line 7 by the year 2021. The department also assures that problems and glitches with MRT 3 will not happen with the service of MRT 7 once it becomes operational. Joe Anano tells us why. Officials from the Department of Transportation or DOTR and representatives of San Miguel Corporation conducted an inspection earlier today on the construction site of MRT-7. As of today, the construction of the project is more than 40% completed. This includes structures such as train stations, platforms and railways. MRT-7 is a 23-kilometer railway project that will connect North Avenue in Quezon City to San Jose del Monte in Bulacan. Its 14 stations are North Avenue, Quezon City Memorial Circle, University Avenue, Tandang Sora, Don Antonio, Batasan, Mangahan, Doña Carmen, Regalado, Mindanao Avenue, Quirino, Sacred Heart, Tala, and San Jose del Monte, Bulacan. According to Transportation Undersecretary for Railways, Timothy John Batan, they are targeting the partial operability of MRT-7 by 2021. This will cover the 15-kilometer stretch of the railway from North Avenue in Quezon City up to Sacred Heart Station in Calaocan City. The government, in coordination with the contractor, has also completed the purchase of 36 train sets from South Korea, as well as the construction of its depot, which has been a problem since then. The concessionaire already proposed a solution and Secretary Tugade already uh, approve the solution and uh, give us a few weeks. We're just implementing it. Uh, pag ready na po kami, we will announce it. But malaking malaki po yung matitipid natin na uh, oras uh, in terms of implementation uh, once this solution is in place. The government targets to finish the entire line of MRT-7 by 2022. Once completed, travel time from Quezon City to San Jose del Monte Bulacan will be trimmed down to 34 minutes from the current 4 hours. It is expected to have a daily ridership of more than 500,000. Meanwhile, the Transportation Department assures the public that problems and glitches with MRT-3 will not happen with the services of MRT-7. Yusek Batan says they are working in close coordination with the private sectors in handling and managing the operations of MRT-7. The government is planning to impose penalties if the concessionaire fails to provide corresponding commuting experience for the riding public. May mga performance indicators po tayo. Uh, at na kapag hindi po yan na fulfill ng ating concessionaire, meron din po yung corresponding financial penalties. So uh, we're expecting po that to add to the assurances na mapapatakbo po ng maayos yung linya pagkatapos po nitong na matapos uh, in 2021-2020. On the other hand, the construction of the common station in North Avenue, Quezon City that will connect LRT1, MRT3, and MRT7 is now 30% completed. The DOTR expects the completion of this project by next year. John Anu, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. 
An image of the 363-foot-tall Saturn V rocket that carried the Apollo 11 crew to the moon 50 years ago was projected on the facade of the Washington Monument on Tuesday. The Apollo 11 Saturn V rocket launched on July 16, 1969 from Kennedy Space Center's launch pad. The historic moon mission saw Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin become the first men to step foot on the lunar surface, an event that enraptured Americans and marked a preeminent chapter in human space flight. NASA is aiming to send humans back to the moon as soon as 24, 2024 in a hastened timeline set by U.S. Vice President Mike Pence. Rare conjoined twins connected by their skulls have been separated after 50 hours of operation at the London Children's Hospital. Jovic Bermas explains why. Two-year-old twins joined that the head have undergone successful surgery at a British hospital to separate their skulls, brains, and blood vessels. The highly complex surgery involved multiple operations on Safa and Mara Ula, who were born in Pakistan in January 2017 with a condition known as craniopagus, in which the girls' skulls and parts of their brains were joined and intertwined. The, the really important thing is to set, be able to separate the brain successfully and then repair the skull over the top of it so that you have a two complete people at the end. Around 50 sets of Craniopagus twins are estimated to be born around the world every year, of which only around 15 are thought to survive beyond the first 30 days of life. Dunaway said the separation was helped by state-of-the-art technology including virtual reality, advanced imaging and three-dimensional rapid prototyping, allowing the surgeons to use images of the girls' brains and blood vessels to plan and practice the surgery in advance to minimize complications. The procedures took place at London's Great Ormond Street Hospital, with the girls well enough to be discharged from hospital four months later on July 1st. Five months after their final operation, Safa and Mara are making slow but steady progress. They're making good recovery at the moment, but it's a little too early to be able to comment uh, definitively about their future. So we're optimistic um, that they will make a good recovery and hopefully we'll be able to show that in the months to come. The surgery, which was paid for by a private donor, has been followed by several smaller procedures to enable the girls to live independent lives. The operations added up to more than 50 hours of surgery time and involved 100 members of GOSH staff. Jovic Burmas, UNTV News and Rescue, London, United Kingdom. A three-man band who hail from Rizal say they are thankful they are still together until now since the day they began to hit the drum, strum the guitar, and sing songs. They also share pieces of advice to other band startups to reach their goal and finally say this is the time. Nina Emilio will tell us why. The band, who were the interpreter of ASAP Year 7 winning song Tugtog, share that they continue to hone their skills as they embark on a new musical journey with BMPI Talent Center. They also have a few pieces of advice to their fellow musicians who have begun their mission to reach their dream of becoming a star someday. Tiwala po tayo sa Panginoon. Diyos po ang nagbibigay po ng lahat ng bagay. Kung sa panahon po ngayon ay hindi pa dapat ibigay, eh baka doon pa po sa dulo, eh magtiis lang po tayo. Na kami, kami po kasi, uh, pa, start pa lang din po kami at sinusuportahan nga po kami ng BMPI. Diretso lang po tayo kung ano yung goal po na gusto niyong makuha, i-goal niyo lang po yun tapos dire diretso lang po tayo. Watch Brads as they sing their heart out, together with Plethora, Rhea Basco, and The Wishfuls in their This Is The Time concert series. Ito, pasalamat po kami sa lahat ng nanonood, sa, tsaka sa mga manonood pa ng series po ng concert namin with other BMPI talents. Um, thank you, thank you so much po sa management namin, BMPI talents. For schedules and updates, just visit the BMPI Talent Center official Facebook page. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the reasons behind the news this July 17, 2019. On behalf of Angelo Castro III, I am Alex Baltazar, and before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening.
we would like to assure everybody, as we have just assured the Philippine National Police, that our rally will definitely be a very, very peaceful and organized rally. We will try to come up with the new slaughterhouse. Uh, In-city vertical housing program will uh, also be constructed here. And it's going to be a community of uh, development. Mga performance indicators po tayo uh, at na kapag hindi po yan na uh, fulfill ng ating concessionaire, meron din po yung corresponding financial penalties. So uh, we're expecting po that to add to the assurances na mapapatakbo po ng maayos yung linya pagkatapos po nitong uh, matapos uh, in 2021-2022. So, ibig sabihin yung intensity ng bagyo, hindi porke maulan ay malakas na yung bagyo. So, talagang doon tayo tumitingin sa lakas ng hangin na dala niya. Kaya, pinalitan ho natin ito or nirevise po natin ito ng wind signal.